Hey, good morning. We're so glad you're watching with us. Welcome. Always feels weird saying welcome uh, to First Baptist. We hope you've had a great week. And as you can see, as the, as the state has sort of uh, started lifting some of the restrictions, um, uh, we're allowed to have other people up here with us. So I got Mary Beth and Andy with me. Um, super excited to have them join us in singing. Um, we're going to go ahead and start with, uh, honestly, the perfect place to start, making much of the name of Jesus. We're going to start by singing your name. As morning dawns and evening fades, you inspire songs of praise that rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name. tower your name is a shelter like no other your name let the nation sing it louder cause nothing has the power to save but your name Jesus, in your name we pray, come and fill our hearts today, Lord, give us strength to live for you, and glorify your name, your name is a strong and mighty tower your name is the shelter like no other your name let the nation sing it louder cause nothing has the power to save but your name is the strong and mighty tower your name is a shelter like no other your name let the nation sing it louder cause nothing has the power to save but your name Really good to have people singing with me. <laughs> All right, next we're going to sing Come Thou Fount. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of God's unchanging love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help i've come and i hope by thy good pleasure 
safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Father God, we do confess that we are prone to wander. Um, God, weekly, daily, uh, God, sometimes it feels like every hour uh, we lose sight of you. But Jesus, we thank you that you do not lose sight of us. God, for giving us uh, your spirit to bring us back and for making us more like you every day. And God, uh, one of the main ways that you make us like you is through your word. So we pray as Jimmy comes and teaches from your word, that you would open our hearts to receive what you have to say. God, thank you so much for your, for your word. Um, we just pray that we would be teachable by it. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to see you this morning. I hope you are having a wonderful and blessed weekend. I know we've been praying for you again this week. Uh, we want you to know that we are here in any way that you might need, whether that's a conversation or a prayer. Uh, we'd love to serve you however we can. What we typically do throughout the week, like we've sent these emails, we, we want you to send in and, and let us know if you even want to spend some time getting connected to a gospel community or discipleship or, or any kind of those things. We can plug you in uh, sometime throughout the week. So send an email to me at jimmy at firstbaptistarango.org uh, and we can get you connected. You need to be in relationship, and that is the best way to do that here at the church. Also, as Josh mentioned, uh, the, as the government continues to uh, relax some of their suggestions, uh, with air quotes, suggestions, uh, we're going to come up with and have a plan uh, for how we roll out the reconvening of like gospel communities and, and even the Sunday morning gathering, uh, and so be on the lookout for that in the coming days. Obviously, this is not going to be quick. Uh, it's not going to be tomorrow. It's not going to be next week. It probably won't be two weeks from now, but uh, we want you to know that we're thinking about that as we long for the day when we can gather with one another once again. So today we're going to be in John chapter 5, uh, and we're going to start in verse 1 and go through verse 18. Uh, and so if you'll follow along with me, um, we'll read this together. John chapter 5. Verse 1, it says, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which had five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, while I am going another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is this man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn. 
As there was a crowd in the place, afterward Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing the things on, doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making him equal with God. And so before we pray, I want you to think about one thing. And the thing I want you to think about in this moment is the idea of what does it mean for Jesus to be Lord? What does it mean for Jesus to be Lord? Um, I, I know this can be a really kind of sticky question for a lot of people, but it has a lot of implications for these verses we're going to read. And so as I pray, uh, or even pause the video, to be honest with you, pause the video and, and, and contemplate that for the moment. What does it mean for Jesus to be Lord? Because really, if we're Christians, then Jesus is Lord over our life. And so what does that mean for Jesus to be Lord over your life? But Jesus is also Lord over all the things of the universe. And so what does that mean for you, and how have you always thought about it? So think about that as we pray, uh, because we're going to see two different ways how Jesus is Lord today. So uh, let us pray. God, I, uh, I thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your lordship that overcomes and, um, and destroys strongholds. And so, God, may you reveal yourself to us today, and may you be everything in our heart and in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so if you'll notice in verse 1 through 3, it says that after this there was a feast of the Jews, which we don't know what that feast was. It doesn't answer that for us, which honestly there's a lot of things in this passage that we really don't get answers to, which I kind of love um, because it reveals to me and it reminds me that, oh, that's right, I'm not God and I can't know everything, but God does. And so he knows the answers to all the questions that don't get answered in this passage. And so there was a feast of the Jews. Jesus went up to the pool of Jeru- uh, went up to Jerusalem. Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate which was north of the temple, which was north of the temple. In fact, it's called the sheep gate because they would bring the sheep into this moment. They would bring the sheep into the pool and wash them before they were going to go be sacrificed. Um, and in Aramaic it's called Beth- Bethesda, uh, which means that it's the house of mercy. And so in the house of mercy, uh, there were many, many people that were laying there blind, lame, and paralyzed. And what's cool about this pool of Bethesda is that you can actually go see it in Jerusalem today. In fact, in the late 1800s, they were doing excavations below the city, and below the city they found these five colonnades, which they then matched up and go, hey, this is Bethesda. Uh, this must be the pool of Bethesda where these people and where this story came from. And so it's a pretty cool thing. Um, but then in, you'll notice after verse 3 where it says, In these lay a mut- multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there uh, who had been an invalid for 38 years. And if you're like me, you're probably wondering, wait a minute, it just jumped from verse 3 to verse 5. How does that work? And really, we're going to dive into this a lot more, probably when we get to the end of chapter 7 into chapter 8. But in verse 4, in the King James, or the Authorized Standard Version, it says this. It says, For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole with whatsoever disease he was holding to. And so uh, what's interesting about that verse is really it's hard to understand verse 7 because you have no idea what's going on in verse 7 without that verse, which in verse 7 it says, The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me down into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. And so there's this little, there's the story beneath the story here. But what's crazy about this and the reason why our ESV translation that we use Uh, doesn't have verse 4 is because actually uh, we have come as we have gathered all these ancient manuscripts of the Bible we have come to find out that this was something that really kind of might have been added a little bit later it wasn't connected to the earliest uh, most consistent and our best manuscripts that we have and so instead of just kind of going uh, rewriting all the numbers and all the verses and all the chapters in the Bible they just decided to completely skip verse 4 which was original in the King James Version 
And again, there's way more to that. It's pretty cool. Just know that literally both conservative and liberal scholars have all axed out verse number four because really what they think is uh, they were, as they were writing and they were getting to verse three and four and five, they just kind of put this little note on the side to kind of give an example because they had heard the story of something that might have been happening, maybe a legend or, or something else. And so they wrote it on the margin because they understood that it would help explain verse seven. What's interesting, though, too, which is, I kind of love this, um, in the ancient world, in the Greek world, uh, they actually had these places of pagan worship that were pools that were all centered around springs. And the idea was, was that there was this god, this healing god, named uh, Ascoplius or something like this, and I don't want to say the name again because I'll butcher it, but I think you're seeing a picture of him right now on the screen. And this guy right here is actually the god, the god of healing in the ancient world, in the Greek religions, in the Greek mythology. And so what actually was kind of going around was this syncretism of, hey, we believe in uh, the god of the Old Testament and in, in that really was being worshipped just a few hundred feet away. But also, we're going to bring in this other God because we believe that something happens when somebody gets in this pool. And, and really, in a sense, it might be this pagan God that is doing the healing. Uh, but just like with some things, they, we, we tried to come up with another explanation. We said it's an angel, which is where verse 4 comes from. And so you have this pagan religion meshed, meshed with this uh, this religion of the Bible, and, and it created this, really, in a sense, this story right here, and it helped create it. And, and it's not just put there for no reason. It's not just to go, hey, they believed in pagan things, but it's to declare something else to us. And so what is it trying to show us, and what is it trying to declare to us? Let's read uh, John 3, 3 through 6, and it says there, it says, in, many, in these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that he had already been there a long time. He had already been there a long time. I mean, overstatement, I mean, really, this guy had been there for 38 years, which is longer than the life of Jesus, longer than the life of Jesus. In fact, it was longer than most people will have lived. I mean, so this man had been an invalid for, I mean, really in that time, lifetimes. And he had just been, at this point, laying by the pool going, man, I am waiting to get down in there. I'm, I am waiting to experience real life, maybe for the first time, that he, he's ever known. And so what does Jesus ask this man? He asks this man, he says, in verse 6, he says, when Jesus saw him lying there and he knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? Man, what a question. And I mean, it seems like an easy question. And not only that, but I think some of us can go, this dude's laying there for, been laying there for a really long time. And you're asking him, do you want to be healed? Obviously, he wants to be healed, but as funny as that is, like, honestly, being a pastor for, what, the last uh, 10 years or so, uh, one thing I've learned is that when people are in bad places and they want to get healed, uh, oftentimes, they don't want to get healed, and what do I mean by that? Um, man, I want to change. I have this thing. I, basically, we're talking about sin in this case. God, I, I have this sin that's holding me down, that's crushing me. Uh, that's really enslaved me. It's destroying my friendships, my marriages, my marriage, all of these different things. Okay, so what do you want to do about that? Well, man, I, you know, I'm going to do this, this, and this. Are you willing to do anything? Yeah, I'm willing to do anything. Three months later, you haven't heard from the person. They've not, re they've not reconnected with you. Uh, you've reached out to them, and they've really said, you know what? Uh, I, that sounded good, but I'm not willing to do anything. And so for us, when Jesus, who is always before us going, when, especially when it comes to our own sin, and he's going, do you want to be healed? Do you actually want to be healed? Or really, honestly, are you more comfortable in your own sin? Are you comfortable with uh, the drugs and the alcohol, the pornography, uh, the anger, the slander, the pride? Are you more comfortable with those things because you know what it's like? And to be honest, you don't know what life would be like without them. Are you willing to give up your friend group? 
maybe even your hopes and your dreams for the sake of Jesus and to be truly healed. And really, even this man right here, because in some ways, he's been, this is the life that he knows, one of being an invalid, and he doesn't know what life on the outside is going to look like. And Jesus is coming here, and he goes, do you want to be healed? And with that, though, too, when we hear that, do you want to be healed? And Jesus offers that to us. Immediately, I go, okay, I want to be healed right now. Does Jesus always heal us in every way right now? No, he does not always heal us right now. Just like last week we talked about how God answers our prayers and he says yes, no, or not yet. He does the same thing with healing. Maybe he's going to heal you today by a prayer, by the working of his power, just like he's about to heal this guy. Or maybe you have to go through surgery and uh, you're going to have to do, uh, uh, oh my gosh, you're going to have to have doctors help you. Why am I blanking on what the term, the name of these doctors are? Anyway, it is what it is. Um, <laughs> so funny. Anyway, so then you have to go get rehab. That's what I'm talking about. You have to go get rehab on your knee or your back or your wrist or whatever until you're actually healed, and it takes that amount of time. Or with sin. I know people that were alcoholics for 30 years that came to know Jesus and were healed immediately. That is a gift from God. That doesn't happen every time. For some of us, The fights of our addictions are for a lifetime. But that doesn't mean we won't be healed and he is not healing us as we go. It means that he will be faithful and he will one day heal us because that is his promise. And so back to this guy. This guy is asked, do you want to be healed? And how does he respond? Verse 7, it says, the sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up and while I am going another steps down before me. Jesus asks him a yes-no question, and he does not answer the question. Yeah, I mean, really, in a sense, you're kind of answering it how I would answer, right? Because you're going, I'm sitting here by the pool. What do you think I want to do? Don't you know that I want to get down in the pool? Why would I be here if I didn't want that to happen? But he answers it this way, and, and I think it's kind of a, just a reaction to how he's doing it. And what's cool about this, do you notice that in that verse it says, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. What does he realize? That he needs help. That he needs a savior. He needs a functional savior for the healing of his body because he's not going to make it on his own. He is not going to be healed on his own. He needs somebody to be his savior and put him in the water that he might be healed. And so how does Jesus answer and what does Jesus do in that moment? Verse 8, it says, Jesus said to him, get up, take your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and he walked. Out of all the invalids that were sitting around the pool, out of all of those that were blind, lame, or paralyzed, Jesus knew this man to the very core and he healed him. He healed him. He came up and he goes, I choose you to heal you in this moment instantaneously. And we call it a miracle because it doesn't happen very often. And miracles tend to happen instantaneously. And this man was the recipient of this grace. What is grace? Grace is an undeserved gift. It's unmerited favor. And God, in Christ, granted him that this. To be honest, what I thought about immediately when I read this passage is in our day and time, if Jesus walked up to this guy um, and he heals him, there's a chance that that person goes, hey man, you healed me, why didn't you heal those guys? Why didn't you heal that person? Why didn't you heal this person? Because honestly, we are for some reason, we, because of our, our work ethic and this give and take economy in which we live, we struggle to accept grace. We struggle to accept the gift of God that's given freely that we don't earn, and this man received that. And not only that, we have this idea of everything must be fair. If everything's fair, as one pastor that I had said, then you get hell, because that is fair. Fair is the judgment of God. What we want is grace. And this man was pointed out and identified for the grace of God In this moment, what an amazing reality for this guy, but also one that will echo into eternity that we get to talk about. And guess what? You get to experience grace 
every day in some way. Just the fact that you can hear God speak through his word and and he changes and transforms you is the grace of God. The grace of God is that you have your identity found not in what you do, but what has been done for you in Christ. That he has died for you, that he has made you his part of his family, that he has given you all the value and worth that you need in eternity, not just for the moment. But the problem was, this guy didn't even recognize Jesus. It kind of just blows my mind. It's like, oh cool, thanks for healing me, man, and takes off. Just doesn't find out his identity, nothing. And, and what's interesting is he's not the only one that doesn't recognize Jesus. If you think back, you have Nicodemus that never really understood what Jesus was talking about or even necessarily who he was. Uh, the woman at the well was the same way. She didn't recognize who he was as the living water. And so now we come to this place and this guy doesn't even ask Jesus or engage him on who he was, what his identity was. And what's cool, and then we're going to read in verse 12 through 15 really quick, and it says uh, about the Jews, and it says, they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? And now the man had been healed and he did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn. And there was a crowd in place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and he said, see, you are well. So Jesus found him again. And he said, see, you are well. You are well. And um, then the man went away. Or sorry, and, sorry, I, I lost my place again. Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was after Jesus had withdrawn. Afterwards, Jesus found him and he said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. And so not only was this man given grace, but this man actually was a, the suffering he was experiencing was the result of his own sin in his own life. That's what all the commentators would say is the reason why this man, uh, the the reason why Jesus reacts to this man in this way and he says sin no more is because his sin is what resulted in his suffering. And so we've talked before that sometimes, like we will read in chapter 9, that uh, sin sometimes is just a reality in the world that we experience. Uh, In chapter 9, a kid was born blind And what the verses will say is that it will be for the glory of God because Jesus will heal him. And so sometimes it just happens because we are born into a broken world, and so we suffer as a result of a broken world in which we live. But then also, sometimes too, we experience uh, being a victim of someone else's sin. And all of us have lived this. If you have any relationship ever, which you do because you were born to parents, you have experienced the sin of somebody else in your life, and you have suffered because of it. But then also we sin or we suffer because we sin. We suffer because we sin. Whether that's maritally, relationally, uh, in our workplaces, uh, any number of things, because of things that we have decided to do, we suffer, right? It's, it's, sometimes it's like the alcoholic, the drug addict, the porn addict. Guess what? You are not just a victim, but you have chosen in that moment to do those things. And so we suffer because of the sins that we commit when we say, God, I want it, your, I want it my way, not your way. I know it's best for me. I know where I'm going to find the greatest comfort and the greatest life, and I think that is in this way that I'm going to choose rather than your way. And so they, he didn't recognize Jesus, and he has experienced the suffering, and Jesus says, go and sin no more. And so now we get to read verse 9 through 13, and we're going to go back up. And the reason why I did this is, Uh, for the lordship question. But in verse 9 through 13, it it says this, and at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and he walked. Now that day, Jesus, now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, and there was a crowd in the place. And so Jesus heals him, and he heals him on the Sabbath, and he says, get up, take your bedroll, and walk. And so what, what happens? This guy has about a split second to experience the healing of God, and then he's suffering in a different way, right? We talked about how at times we can suffer from the realities of the people that are around us because we're born into a broken world. That's what happened. Suffering to suffering. Congratulations, welcome to walking, right? 
And that is not fun, and that is not a fun reality. But sometimes we all experience this truth. But why is he suffering? And he's suffering because these people love their rules more than they love the man. Not only did they love the rules more than they love the man, they misinterpreted the rules. And, this, and because of the misinterpretation of the rule and not understanding the, the, the basis, the bedrock, the substance of the rule, then they were not able to love their neighbor as themselves. And so what is the Sabbath? So we can have a clear picture of what God meant. The Sabbath actually comes really from the beginning of creation. God, in seven days, seven nights, he created the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, God said he rested from all of his work. And what was that work? It was the work of creation, right? That's what he rested from. He didn't rest from sustaining the earth. Because guess what? If God rested from sustaining the earth, we would not be here. So he rested from sustaining the earth. But then also, we see that keep the Sabbath is actually the fourth commandment as well. In Exodus 34, 21, it says, six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest, you shall rest. And so the thing about that, the thing about the truth of this thing is that the Sabbath was not made as something to be kept in order to burden people, but to relieve them, to give them rest, to give them refocus, and to give them life. And what these men were doing right here, like they have done, really, that we'll see throughout the rest of the Gospels, even like Matthew 9 through 14, uh, there was this episode with Jesus, and he says, uh, he went on from there and entered into the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand, and they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? And he said to them, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is this man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched, out, stretched it out and it was restored healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him and how to destroy him. By not loving their neighbor, they reveal their lack of love for God because the, legal, the legalistic regulations were never God's intent for the Old Testament law. They had made something that was made to give life into something that gave death. That's never God's intention for the Old Testament law. God gives the law in order to bring life. In fact, in... Um, in some of the verses in, in, in Mark, it says that, that the, Sabbath was not in, the Sabbath was made for man, not men for the Sabbath. And what's cool now here with Jesus kind of attacking these, with them asking this man about the Sabbath and how, why Jesus healed him and all these different things, what we're going to come to find out that we, we found out in so many other verses is that Jesus, in fact, is not just Lord God, and he is not just this man that healed this, but he is Lord of the Sabbath, and he determines what the Sabbath is for and how it is to be, bring life. And so they're asking him these questions because they have all these legalistic tendencies that if they, this man doesn't do this thing or Jesus does this thing, then they are out of line with what God's will is. The problem is they are telling that to the Lord of the Sabbath, to the God of the universe. And so they go to Jesus. They go to Jesus and um, after, after the, the invalid, the blind, this man that had been laying by the pool goes to him and he goes, hey, I found out who it was that healed me. It was this Jesus guy, which kind of sounds like tattletaling to me. Like, why would he do that? Why would this man, after he'd been healed, is he going to declare the good news that he was healed or is he going to go, hey, I know you're looking for that guy. It was this guy over here. He, he healed me on the Sabbath. And so afterwards, after Jesus found him, uh, the man went away and the Jews and the Jews go looking for Jesus. And it says in verse uh, 16, it says, and this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered him, answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. He doesn't come up with some argument from the Old Testament where he's like, well, if you happen to know, this theological, this theological thing, this fact this tidbit, this theme, he doesn't do that. He just goes, you know why I can work on the Sabbath? Because I am. I am the God of the universe. The Father was working and I am now. God in Christ is going, you know that Father that you believe in? That God you've been worshiping? I am him and you are not recognizing me as such. 
therefore you are rejecting me. And these guys are going, wait a minute, you just called yourself God. What do we do with that? And so first in this passage, we've seen one thing. We see that Jesus walks into this pagan place where they believe that the pagan temples are going to heal them. But Jesus overwhelms them with his lordship. He is the Lord of healing, and he heals this man instantaneously. And see, it goes, I am better than that. You're not going to make it into the pool. You haven't made it in that pool, and so I'm going to heal you now. But then he also says, hey, Jewish people, religious people, you're making all of these rules. You're making all of these rules. But what I'm going to tell you is that I am Lord of the Sabbath. I am the ruler of all of these things. You are not meant to manipulate and misunderstand and and take the law out of context. The law that is meant to bring life, you make it bring death. I am the Lord over that. I'm going to rewrite it. I'm going to bring heaven to earth. And this is my example. So not only will I heal, but I will give freedom and bring back what the Sabbath is meant to bring. And so will they in this moment submit to the authority of Jesus Christ or will they rebel against it? And isn't this the question we have to ask every day to ourselves? Are we going to obey the lordship of Christ? Will we fall under the lordship of Christ and obey him knowing that in him we will find life and life abundant or will we go you know what i'm going to go my own way i'm going to believe my own things i'm going to create my own rules for people to follow because in them i'm going to create my own way of salvation which one are we going to do am i going to follow the lord or am i going to be my own lord and it's cool that it's not just the minor details it and it's not just the big thing but it's everything in between that god in christ is lord over And so in that, are we going to trust him today? Because Jesus, in being Lord of the Sabbath, he becomes our rest. In Christ, being Lord of the Sabbath, he fulfills all the law and the prophets. He doesn't break any of those things, but he makes them true. He is the healer of all of the world. Not even just this man in this moment, but all things, because he's going to make them all new. And so will we really trust in the Lordship of Christ? Will we bring everything in our lives into submission to him, knowing that his way is better than our way. He is more satisfying than all things. That in him is life and life abundant, and not the things that we run to and hope for and long for. And so where will we this week, where will we this week find life? And honestly, it's only going to be in the lordship of Christ. And and here's the deal, though. Just like this man, when Jesus said, he goes, hey, sin no more. The reason why he's saying that is because not only is he saying and commanding him sin no more, but he's not just leaving him alone. And just like that, Christ doesn't leave us alone. He empowers us to walk in his ways that we might experience the life that he has for us. Not the ones that we think would be the best, but his. All joy and satisfaction and the end of all of our hope is most perfectly found in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who, as we've seen, is both Lord of healing and Lord of the Sabbath. And so may that be true of us this week as we go about life that we don't understand, that we might be fearful about, that we're anxious about, but there is one who knows, who understands, who's seen and experienced but is also Lord over. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your love for us. I thank you that you are Lord, that you are God, that you are Savior, that you are healer, that you are uh, Lord of the Sabbath, that, God, we don't have to make extra rules to prove our salvation or to gain our salvation or even to create uh, new ways of salvation for other people because, God, We just must believe in you. We must just trust you. We must just bring our lives into uh, submission to you, the Lord of all. And God, thank you that we don't do that alone. Thank you that you empower us, that you by grace have gone, I love you. 
I have pursued you, I've died for you, I've forgiven you, and now walk in my ways by the power of my spirit. And so God, may you help us to do that. May we come under your lordship and find life and life abundant. May we believe, may we have hope, and may we have joy everlasting uh, under the kind care of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who you are, the good God of our whole universe, the creator of the world and the savior of our souls. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Thanks for that, Jimmy. Um, as he was talking about uh, in the end of his prayer, we, uh, we can't do anything outside of the power of Christ um, through the work of the Spirit. Um, but uh, thankfully for us, we, we do have that. He did accomplish a great work on the cross. So let's, uh, let's sing about that. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, his power is displayed. To this I hold. My shepherd will defend me Through the deepest valley he will lead Oh, the night has been won And I shall overcome Yet not I, but through Christ in me No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold. My sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing. I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus. For he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me. Until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold. 
My hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Awesome. We're gonna we're gonna end with glory to God forever. Um, I love going out on this song. Uh, just because it's a great song of benediction, a great song to remind us uh, what our purpose is. So uh, my hope and my prayer is that in this time, um, in this recorded service, that you've been recharged and renewed, uh, and hopefully um, with a new, a new mission, a new vision to bring glory to God with this week. So let's sing. Before the world was made, before you spoke it to be, you were the king of kings. Yes, you were, yes, you were, and now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out, we join them as we sing glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Creator God, you gave me breath so I could praise your great and matchless name all my days, all my days. So let my whole life be a blazing offering, a life that shouts and sings the greatness of our King. Glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Take my life. So take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. So take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. So take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. So take my 
God, we pray that you would take our lives and let them be for your glory. As we just sang, God, use this week in all of us, um, God, to encourage one another, to encourage those who know you, God, to, uh, to share hope with those who do not know you. God, this is a time of a lot of hopelessness, a lot of uncertainty, but Jesus, in you, we have all the hope and certainty that we need. Uh, let us uh, just continually run to you um, as we need you, which is all the time. Jesus, it is in your name that we pray. Amen. Thanks, you guys. We'll see you next week.